I will awaken the dawn as my prayer ascends to you. Well, good morning. Welcome to the Journey Church. We're glad you're here. The Apostle Peter and the Apostle John have just witnessed 5,000 people coming to faith in Jesus Christ. Wow. They are on a spiritual high, to be sure. But then out of the blue, they are both arrested. Were they just sitting there in that Roman jail, thinking back to the time when John the Baptist was also arrested for his faith in Jesus, and then he was beheaded? Or maybe they were thinking back to when Jesus himself was arrested by the very same people, and Jesus ended up being crucified what are Peter and John thinking? What are they going to do? Now let's bring it closer to home. What if it were you sitting in that jail cell that night? What would be going through your mind if you had been arrested and you just sat in jail all night long for your faith in Jesus Christ? What would you be feeling about God with this latest persecution against you? That said, on our next slide, you'll see the title of our sermon series, Christ, Christianity, and the Church. Christ, Christianity, and the Church. On our next slide, you'll see today's sermon title and passage, Persecution Led to Joy, Praise, and More Ministry. Persecution Led to Joy, Praise, and More Ministry will be in Acts chapter 4, verses 19 through 31. So if you will, please open your Bibles to the book of Acts, into chapter 4 and turn to verse 19. If you do not bring a Bible with you this morning, we have the scripture up on the screens for you. As you are turning to our passage, let me bring you up to speed with what has happened. It is the next morning, and Peter and John have been brought out of jail and have been brought before the religious leaders and council and are being questioned about why and in whose name they have healed the lame beggar. They have already been told previously by the council to no longer speak or teach at all to any man in the name of Jesus. Now, here is Peter and John's response to the religious council. On our next several slides, you'll see our scripture passages up on the screens. Acts chapter 4, verses 19 through verses 31, and I'll be reading out of the NASB version. But... Peter and John answered and said to them, Whether it is right in the sight of God to give heed to you rather than to God, you be the judge. For we cannot stop speaking about what we have seen and heard. When they had threatened them further, they let them go, finding no basis on which to punish them on account of the people because they were all glorifying God for what had happened. For the man was more than 40 years old on whom this miracle of healing had been performed. When they had been released, they went to their own companions and reported all that the chief priest and the elders had said to them. And when they heard this, they lifted their voices to God with one accord and said, O oh Lord, it is you who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them who by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of our father David your servant said, Why did the Gentiles rage and the peoples devise futile things? The kings of the earth took their stand and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. For truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed both Herod and and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your purpose predestined to occur. And now, Lord, take note of their threats and grant that your bondservants may speak your word with all confidence while you extend your hand to heal and signs and wonders take place through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place where they were gathered together was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak the word of God with boldness. On our next slide, you'll see a picture of a book. 
It is entitled Fresh Power by Pastor Jim Cimbala. He is the current pastor of the Brooklyn Tabernacle in New York. He's been the pastor there probably some 40 years or more. And uh, this is a very godly man, a very godly church. I don't see many things happening in other churches around our country by what's happening in that particular church. He's written several books, and this one's called Fresh Power, and it's on the person and ministry of the Holy Spirit. And it's a correct interpretation. Many people today teach things that are not appropriate to be taught about the person and how the Holy Spirit moves in our lives. And so this is a very good book for you to buy. You can go to Half Price Books and you can buy it for a really inexpensive price like $5, $6 versus going to one of the main stores where you'll pay $15 to $21. So I highly encourage you to be able to pick up that book and read it along during the week so that you don't just come and hear a sermon. You're actually coming prepared. You have actually studied a good book that has many of the scriptures that we're going through and a great breakdown of them. So now let's take a moment and let's walk through these verses individually and see what is pulled out of them. Verse 19, but Peter and John answered and said to them, whether it is right in the sight of God to give heed to you rather than to God, you be the judge. For we cannot stop speaking about what we have seen and heard. That is a life transformed. They could not for their life stop talking about, teaching about, and preaching about Jesus Christ. They couldn't do it. So they just told him and said, whether you believe it's right for us to stop, we're not going to stop. We're going to continue. And I want to read to you Galatians chapter 1, verses 10. Now, this is the Apostle Paul. But listen, Paul says something very uh, close to what Peter is saying here. Listen to what Galatians 1, 10 says. For I am, for am I now seeking the approval of man? Or of God? Or am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. You cannot serve both God and man. So Christian, you're going to have to make up your mind. Are you going to serve God? Or are you going to serve man? Verse 21, when they had threatened them further, they let them go, finding no basis on which to punish them. On account of the people, because they were all glorifying God for what had happened. Isn't that sad? A man that's more than 40 years old has been lame all of his life, and he's begging. And they have been used by the Holy Spirit of God to bring healing to this man. And these religious leaders want to put a cap on it. They want to put a top on it. They don't want that shared. They want to put that back in a closet. A miracle has been done by the God of the universe and the religious leaders wanted to put a cap on it and to snuff it out. I believe miracles need to be made known. Because God says they need to be made known. God is revealing himself. He is saying, I am showing up through the power of the Holy Spirit in the name of Jesus Christ, my son, through these apostles, and I am am showing my healing power. And all of the people were glorified God. So they were concerned about what people would think. See, they weren't concerned with what God would think. They said, well, everybody's glorifying God over this miracle, so we better not say too much about it because we don't want to riot. Verse 22. For the man was more than 40 years old on whom this miracle of healing has been performed. When they had been released, they went to their own companions and reported all that the chief priests and the elders had said to them and when they had heard this they lifted their voices to God with one accord and said oh Lord it is you who made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that is in them you know it made me stop and think right there what if it was one of us what if it was me or what if it was you and you were arrested or I was arrested for our faith in Jesus Christ we spent all night in jail kind of wondering what in the world could happen to us because of our faith and then we get out we're told we are commanded to no longer speak or teach or preach in the name of Jesus Christ to any man and then we're sent on our way what would we be thinking would we get to the place where all of our companions were let's just say we were showing back up at church would we go can you believe that those people arrested us I missed two days of work because of them now how am I going to pay my rent I mean these guys really held me up I got things to do I got things sitting on my front porch if I don't get that stuff off front porch somebody the mail's already been by I needed to pick that stuff up I've got responsibility now the yard is this high with grass I haven't been able to mow isn't that the way we act 
when something happens to us, we complain, we grumble, we're bitter, we're resentful, we just point fingers at the people. I don't see any complaining here. They weren't complaining about having been arrested and put in jail overnight, questioned, and then sent on their way. There was no complaining. I thought that was highly different from what would happen in our culture in the 21st century versus the first century. They went there, and when they heard this, they lifted their voices to God with one accord. They were joy-filled. They were praising God. They were excited. They saw this as an opportunity to make Christ known. In our culture, a lot of times in our selfish Christianity, they put us out. It cost us something. They wasted my time instead of I got an opportunity to stand before the religious leaders and give another account of the Lord Jesus Christ and what he did for me and what he did for this man isn't that great they got another opportunity to share with the religious leaders it's a perspective thing that they learned that hey this is an opportunity for joy this is an opportunity for praise and then they say, and when they heard this, they lifted their voices to God with one accord and said, Oh Lord, it is you who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. Now they go back and get two passages in this section from Psalms. From Psalms 146, 6 is where they get this. The next one we're about to read is Psalms 2. But they go back to Psalms 146, 6. But it wasn't just Psalms 146, 6. We know that God spoke about making the heavens and the earth and the sea all the way back in Genesis. But then it's also picked up again in Exodus chapter 20, verse 11. Then it's picked up again in Nehemiah 9, 6. And then it's picked up again in Psalms 146, 6. So all the way from Genesis to Psalms, it's mentioned three or four or five times in the scriptures. And they recognize that's what's happening right here. And then verse 25. Who by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said, Why did the Gentiles rage? And the peoples devised futile things. The kings of the earth took their stand. And the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. They actually go back to Psalms 2 and said, you know, this is actually happening in our day. This is, we're witnessing this. We're seeing Psalms 2 actually play out right now. Why did the Gentiles rage? And why the people devise futile things? Listen to me, church. People can devise futile things against the God of the universe. But he is God and we are not. It is futile to plan anything against the Lord. Can anything that man tries or plans succeed against God Almighty? That is futile. And the peoples devise futile things. The kings of the earth took their stand. So here you've got little K. You've got little K kings down here taking their stands against the king, the king of kings, Jesus Christ. How's that going to fare? And the rulers were gathered together. These rulers, these religious rulers, the Sadducees, the priests, the chief priests, and the elders, these people were being spoken about in Psalms 2. These rulers gathered together against the Lord, against his Christ. There is never a time that a spiritual leader needs to stand up and go toe-to-toe -to -toe against the Christ, against Jesus, the Messiah. Verse 27, For truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel. He recognized that all of this was happening right out of Psalms chapter 2. Verse 28, to do whatever your hand and your purpose predestined to occur. Now let's talk about this word predestined. I know a lot of times people have a problem with predestination and election. We get all kind of uh, uh, up in the air about that and we don't understand that. Well, let's talk about what the word predestined means. It means to predetermine. To ordain something. It's not the same as foreknowledge. It's not the same as foreknowing that God's saying, I already know what's going to happen. No, no, no. He predetermined it. He ordained it to happen that way. And that is true to the scriptures. God predetermined. He ordained. He predestined that these people would do these things against 
the Son of God, against Jesus Christ. Now let's move into, and now, Lord, take note of their threats and grant them that your bondservants may speak your word with all confidence. They didn't complain like we do, and they did not even ask God to protect them. Don't you think that's odd? As they're recognizing they now have threats, and they know these are real threats, they arrested John the Baptist and they beheaded him. They arrested Jesus and they crucified him. Now they've been arrested and have been warned and commanded not to teach or speak anymore in the name of Jesus to any man. The same thing could befall them. They don't ask for protection. What is it that we're big on? And I do it all the time myself. Lord, protect us. Lord, put a hedge of protection around us. Don't we all pray that all the time? We see things like this here. They didn't ask for protection. But watch what they do say. While you extend your hand to heal. In verse 29, And now, Lord, take note of their threats and grant that your bondservants may speak your word with confidence. We're not asking you to protect us. Just give us confidence. Give us boldness and help us keep preaching. Didn't even ask for protection. Verse 30, while you extend your hand to heal and signs and wonders take place through the name of your holy servant Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place where they were gathered together was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak the word of God with holiness. Now I want to walk through three slides. Let's look at our next slide. These people, Peter and John, have just been arrested for their faith in Jesus Christ in the first century. There have been many other centuries since the first century that Christians have been arrested for their faith in Jesus Christ. Some of those were released. Some of those have been martyred. Some of them have been killed for their faith in Jesus Christ. Do you not think that maybe there should be some Christians in our day that go through persecution for the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We do see it a lot when we see it on the news and Facebook. When you see what's happening with ISIS on another continent from our country. You see people that are believers in Jesus Christ. And these terrorists are taking them, putting a hood over their uh, head. And if they don't recant Christ, they kill them. But they are standing faith. They're standing strong in their faith just like Peter and John did. And many other Christians have done all the way up until now. But what about the United States? We all agree that things are getting worse. I have yet to talk to anybody in the public that thinks things are getting better. Everybody seems to agree, non-Christians and Christians seem to agree, things are getting worse. Well, if things got to the point that you were arrested for your faith, are you prepared to be arrested because of your faith in Jesus? How would you handle it if you were arrested tomorrow? Will you keep steadfast in your faith with joy and kindness and love, not complaining? Will you be bold and continue to speak in the name of Jesus and share the gospel? You need to be prepared because you never know when your time is coming to stand up for Jesus Christ. Pastor Chuck Swindoll, whom I love dearly, is one of the best pastors in the world. He said this phrase, and I use it often, to be forewarned is forearmed. When you know something's coming, you're prepared for it. Christians should not just be living casually today thinking we're going to be totally fine. Right now, the government gives ministers housing allowance and we get to have churches as nonprofits, and we don't have to pay taxes on your tithes and all of that. The government's leaving us alone. There's coming a time where that may not be the case. And not only that, you can speak in any other false God's name, but you won't be able to speak or teach in the name of Jesus Christ. Are you preparing yourself for that day. Well, let's break down this patches a little bit in a, a vision or something that you can see. Go to the next slide. I broke this down so you could see a little bit about what's happened from Acts chapter 4, verses 19 through 31. Starting with God who is in heaven, it comes from God's hand and God's word down, but yet we're progressing in a linear fashion. God's predestined purpose, what he predetermined, what he ordained was for people to come to faith in Jesus Christ and stand up for Jesus at all cost, even at the cost of your life. So that led Peter and John to go through persecution of Jesus, and then eventually the church itself was under persecution and the church scattered. And we're going to see more of that as we walk through Acts. So God's predestined purpose was that people would know his son, come to faith in his son, and then stand up for the, his son in their faith, even if it brought persecution. And then the persecution often led to 
prison. They would go to jail. And then after they would get out of prison, they would praise God for having had the opportunity and the persecution. And then that would lead to them going back and praying with the church family. And then from that church, praying fervently together, powerful moving of the Holy Spirit. I'm just being faithful to the text. That's exactly what's in Acts chapter 4, 19 through 31. Now, what's a little different in our day? How does this change up? We know that it's still God that sits on the throne in heaven. He still has the predestined purpose of us preaching the gospel, people hearing the gospel, understanding the gospel, putting their faith and trust and belief in Jesus Christ. And we don't see a lot of persecution from that. So if you skip over the persecution then all of a sudden you don't necessarily go to prison for your beliefs in Jesus Christ. And then we do come to church occasionally and we lift up praises to Jesus. And since all you're doing is praising Jesus and there's really no persecution, nothing really heavy weighing on you, you don't really pray much with your church family. Did you know that the least attended ministry of any ministry in most Christian evangelical denominations today is the prayer meeting? The largest attended thing we'll have is what you see right here this morning, 11 o'clock. And then fewer than this at 9.30 Bible study. Even fewer on Wednesday night, which is more Bible study. And even less at the prayer meeting. You know why? Because persecution will bring you to prayer. If you're not being persecuted, you might have a whole bunch of other things you might have to do on Tuesday night. You know, I may go to the movies or maybe I'm just going to work in my yard. Or, you know, I've just been tired for a long week, going to go to bed early. There's nothing really pushing us to pray. I remember one of my seminary professors saying that one day we may get to heaven and wish we had prayed for a lot more persecution and suffering in the name of Christ. Did you know what it means to just live casually about your faith? Most of the people that you admire in Christendom and you go all the way back to whatever century you want to study about, those people suffered for Jesus. Is that not true? Most of the people you highly admire, they all suffered in some major way and were persecuted for their faith in Christ. And we look at them and go, yeah, wow, amen, praise the Lord. But it was because of their suffering. I can name anybody. Corey ten Boom, Martin Luther, Charles Finney, Jonathan Edwards, Charles Spurgeon, Augustine. We could just name all kinds of people that have been persecuted for their faith. Persecution is what drives you to prayer. So what are we going to do if we're not really sensing persecution in our day? What's going to drive us to prayer? I want you to think about it for a minute. What's going to drive you to prayer? We're commanded to pray. There's not a Christian I've ever met that doesn't understand that we are commanded to pray. It's the actual making of the time to pray. We're commanded to pray, and either persecution drives you there or passion drives you there. Persecution or passion. The only people that really show up at a prayer meeting are the people that are passionate about the Lord Jesus Christ. They can't think of being anywhere else. That's where we need to be, is we need to be in prayer. Now look at the last verse. Verse 31, and when they had prayed, when, that's past tense, and when they had prayed, you got to remember, they just got out of prison. They go and they meet up with the church family. Oh man, nothing about going home, grab a quick shower, nothing about grabbing a meal, nothing about catching a nap, man, because that was a really hard bed. I got no sleep last night. None of that. Praise and prayer, praise and prayer. They wanted the church to meet, and when they had prayed, the place where they were gathered together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. Guys, if you look at the beginning of the Christian church at Pentecost, if we really look at how many times you mix prayer with the Holy Spirit moving, prayer, Holy Spirit moving, prayer, Holy Spirit moving, prayer, Holy Spirit moving, you might go, hey, there's a pattern here. Right? I remember Pastor Jim Cimbala, the one that I told you is the author of Fresh Power, the pastor of the Brooklyn Tabernacle in New York, in Brooklyn. He said he has never seen a movement of God in the Old Testament or New where people didn't pray first and then God showed up. I thought that's a pretty bold statement. 
I know he's read the Bible a lot, but really? And he said this back in March of 2009. I have kept my antennas up to see if that's true. I have yet, in all of my studies since 2009, found that to be true, where God just showed up. God's people prayed, and the Holy Spirit came in power. The Holy Spirit comes in power when people pray. So when they had prayed, the place where they had gathered together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and, I love conjunctions, and began to speak the Word of God with boldness. Now, they had been commanded not to do this. Don't speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus to any man. Wouldn't you think that would cause fear? It will cause fear without prayer. You would be shaking in your boots to go out and think that you've still got a ministry here that you need to participate in, but yet you know that you can be arrested, you could be flogged, and you can even be killed. You would be fearful. Any human being would be fearful, even the apostles. But what kept them from being fearful was the prayer. Don't you get a little fearful or kind of feel a little nervous whenever you think about talking about Jesus at your office? Remember, you don't talk about politics and religion at the office. It, uh, bold Christians do. Bold Christians do. Why? Because those people need Jesus. Those people are going to hell. Those people need to hear somebody tell them God loves you and died on the cross for you. Boldness will help you. What if your boss said, look, I've heard you share this stuff around the office or people are starting to complain to me. I can't have you sharing about your faith here in our company anymore. So if you want to talk about stuff like that, do it at church, you know, or do it in your neighborhood but you're not allowed to share your faith in the workplace. There's a lot of companies right now, today, that will tell you that. What are you to do? Bible-believing, Jesus Christ, gospel-saved Christian? You're to say, I'm so sorry. I'm not just at this company for a paycheck. I'm here because God loves every employee here, from the CEO to its board, all the way to the guy that's the janitor or the one that mows the lawn. I am here to bear witness of what's happened to me. Oh, yes, you've hired me because of my skills and educations and equipping to do X and X job, but I can't do my job effectively without being who I am, sharing what I know. I cannot stop talking about what I've seen and heard. The same thing the Apostle Peter said. Did you know that we can go out like Apostle Peter and Apostle John? We don't have their spiritual gifts. We have our own spiritual gifts. Yours may be teaching. Yours may be giving. Yours may be faith. Yours may be administration. Yours may be service. You may have other spiritual gifts. But go out and be Christ's servant in the world. We're not to just praise Jesus' name in here, in the church building. But then have a zip lip once we go out into the public. Right? Why is it that all the other false religions can have any kind of prayer on any kind of school campus they like. Try it in Jesus' name and see if there's not some persecution. Satan never persecutes a false religion. But he's going to persecute the real one. Amen? All right, so what are we going to do as a church? We're going to ask this week, God, fill me with your Holy Spirit. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. If this is your local church, then come to prayer meeting. If not because of persecution, but because of passion, because I love Jesus. And I want to see God do more today in our world than I'm seeing him do currently, because God follows prayer. And if this is not your local church, go back to your local church and go to its prayer meeting. If they don't have one, go talk to your pastor and say, why don't we have a prayer meeting? Why don't we just have Wednesday Bible study? Why do we not have a prayer meeting? A lot of churches don't have prayer meetings today anymore. A lot of churches today don't even offer the Lord's Supper anymore. Things are really changing in Christendom. You need to read your Bible. You need to walk in Christ. And you need to be a prayerful Christian, passionate about the Jesus that died on the cross for you. Last question before we stand and sing. What's going to be different about your Christian life this week since you came to church? What's going to be different this Monday? through Friday, because you came to worship Jesus who died on the cross for you. What's going to be different? 
You think about that as you stand and sing right now.